Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by Dispatch and Dispatch Media. In the grand tradition of counter-programming, as the rest of the world is talking about uh, Super Tuesday and Nikki Haley dropping out of, or suspending, suspending her race, um, uh, we've decided to go into the wide world of human genetics, because that's just what we do. We, we hit where they ain't. And um, I recently, I, I read, uh, I get a great substack called uh, Razib Khan's unsupervised learning and it's basically all about genetics and some of it is over my head and some of it is about stuff that i didn't know i was interested in and some of it is stuff about stuff i did know i was interested in and um uh razib is also the co-founder of a company called generate uh and he both writes and works in the world of uh genetic stuff and he had a really interesting one last week. So I just texted him and was like, hey, do you want to come back on The Remnant and talk about this? Last time he was on, we talked about dogs, um, which we might get into here. I don't remember him saying anything about dogs on this, which is too bad. But he had a, I, I like these kinds of pieces. The title of the piece was The Longer I Live, The Wronger I Get to Be. And it was all about how a lot of the stuff that we thought we knew about genetics or that he thought he knew about genetics is no longer operative because we've learned more about genetics. And he ran through a bunch. I figured we would just talk about the things that he's learned and where the state of genetics is these days. So, Razib, welcome to The Remnant. Hey, Jonah. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, last time we were talking, it was during an election, uh, the 2020 election, and today is, well, not quite the same, but uh, similar. So I guess it's a similar theme. And it's great great to be on. Um, I will say multiple people have told me that they found out about my Substack, which had just started that month. Because of your podcast that that time, the first time. There you go. I move books. I move subsex. Um, that's why people should advertise on here. All right. So what made you want to write this 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 thing? Somebody walk you through the thinking, and then we'll just tackle them one by one, if that's okay. Yeah. Because um, I often talk to people, and they will have... Uh, I try not to do that, but I sometimes have to. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm a talker. You know, I talk to you. You know, I talk to all sorts of people. Um, <laughs> not always advising, but uh, in any case, um, so they will talk about something they have uh, read in, say, the New York Times in 2018, or they read uh, the Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee like five years ago or something. You know, and you know, in, in the normal scheme of things, so let's say you read a book on the French Revolution from five years ago. Okay, well, you know, it's probably mostly you're probably going to be able to understand like. Napoleon or something that movie, right. you know, I don't know. Um, but in genetics, we're not, that's not where we are. Uh, in genetics, especially in some areas, five years is like the Paleozoic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a year is like, okay, yeah, maybe, you know, but, uh, we are at like exponential growth phase of knowledge and data. So, uh, I just, I like to update every couple of years cause I'm updating myself all the time, but I don't always, I don't always say it explicitly. And sometimes it's good. To say, okay, this is where we were, this is where we are. And obviously, if you're not in the field, you need these sorts of landmarks, I think, uh, a bit more. Yeah, but just, I mean, not this isn't, this isn't really pushing back, but I mean, like you mentioned in your piece, Matt Ridley's Genome, which I read a long time ago when it came out. And as you say, it largely holds up, right? Sort of like if you read the, what is it, uh, the, you know, the, the given rise and fall of the Roman Empire. You will learn some wrong big things, but you will also be able to have a conversation about the Roman Empire, right? So, like, yeah. it's not like we've discovered genes don't exist or <laughs> anything like that, right? I mean, yeah, like, yeah. So let me, let me, let me actually, you, you bring up a good point. So the scaffold is the same, like Mendelism, Mendel's laws, uh, genetics, all of that um, applies. So sometimes, you know, you will read in the media, there's been a revolution in our understanding of genetics and. You know, revolutions can happen in different ways. You know, um, the internet was a revolution in information technology. Okay, we can use that word, but uh, it wasn't, I don't know, like the French Revolution, or it wasn't like the understanding of, uh, of uh, like, uh, say, uh, not thermodynamics, but um, like nuclear power, nuclear, you know, it, it wasn't a revolution in our paradigm of what genetics is, but it what has happened in the last generation has been an acceleration in the rate of information acquisition and the data generation. So the way that I can give you a quantitative measure is, you know, this is what I actually have done for my pitches for my startups. So it's like, you know, top of mind. 
the first human genome 24 years ago was $3 billion in today's money. Today, you can get a human genome for $1 to $200. I mean, it's still a human genome, but like $3 billion versus a couple hundred dollars, that is how the revolution is happening. And that is why I need to update quite frequently because, you know, two years ago, maybe there was one genome from Cameroon, but now there's 27. And now we know not quite 27 times more, but two or three times more, maybe, you know? And so that's relevant. And some of these things that we were talking about, that, you know, I talk about in the post, uh, there are some areas where uh, the scaffold is there, but like there's so much detailed within within it that that kind of changes your picture. All right. So th- this is one of these areas where like m- most of the guests I have on here, I know enough about what they're experts in that I can ask questions that I'm not worried about being too stupid. So this is not one of those situations. So by way of bad analogy or by way of analogy, I'm not sure it's a bad analogy in polling. It bothers a lot of people to say, Oh, you can just call 1500 people and claim to know what, what 331 million people think. Right. And the, the classic metaphor explaining this is if you're cooking soup and it's well mixed, all you need is a spoonful to be able to know what's in the entire, you know, uh, pot of soup. How much does our knowledge of genetic populations change with the larger sample size? I mean, is it incremental? Is it geometric? Or is that a dumb question? So I was say, I was going to say two things. I was going to say, not a dumb question. It's a good question. It's also a very common question. So it's actually important to address this um, because it's a common confusion. When you have a one single human genome, that's 3 billion base pairs. And so um, people often say, oh, you have only one sample. And I'm just like, look, I got one sample, but I got 3 billion base pairs. That's that whole person's genealogy. So I got a lot of the information from your parents. I got a lot of the information from your grandparents, great-grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. So when you sample one single genome, like it's not like you're looking at one or two genes. You're looking at the whole genome. So let's say you have a whole genome. We do have whole genomes from Neanderthals. One single Neanderthal is giving you their whole pedigree, actually. Okay? So um, it's a little, uh, I don't say misleading, but I think it um, underemphasizes how much info you can get when you say sample size of one from a genome. Because that's actually like potentially billions of variables, right? Now, getting more individual. So like if I have uh, Jonah Goldberg's genome, for example. Um, much sought I after, you, I have to say. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I could probably find it somewhere. I mean, don't, don't, don't get me on that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I so, I'll, you know, concretely, like I'll have information, for example, about the out of African migration, uh, because it looks like your ancestor is just looking at you, did leave Africa 60,000 years ago. You know, I will have information about what happened to Ashkenazi Jews in medieval Europe and what happened to, you know, Northern Europeans also, right? Just knowing about your background. I'm not going to have information about China. I'm not going to have information about South Asia, et cetera, more, and Africa more recently. So getting more individuals will give me more information. But just having your information, just Jonah Goldberg's information, would tell an alien, oh, this individual's ancestry went through a population bottleneck 60,000 years ago, and you know all of these other things. And so that's what we're getting when we get one single genome. So a lot, not everything. Right. So... How clarifying is it when you get, I mean, like what, what populations do we have the most genomes from for, for the purposes of studying this stuff? I assume it's like Northern Europeans and it's not very, I mean, getting an extra genome for evolutionary reasons is not very clarifying at this point. It's still kind of interesting and relevant for medical reasons because medical, um, you know, disease and medical risk, a lot of that, um, not a lot, but a substantial fraction. I'm not going to say a lot, but I'll say a substantial fraction, um, is, um, you know, controlled or, um, you know, it's caused by rare genetic variants. And so if it's something is rare, obviously you want a sample size of a million as opposed to a hundred, you know? And so for medical genomics, getting a lot more genomes is still relevant. Um, for evolutionary genomics, not nearly as much, especially for Europeans. You, you can figure out a way to lead into your first thing, which was, uh, in this, in your Substack, you broke down the various things that you've, we've learned more you change your mind on because the data has changed. And the first one was from simple out of Africa to it's complicated, but still a lot out of Africa. So when you say you're just looking at me, you can tell I came out of Africa. 
Like, what did that mean in in this context? And and what do you mean by it's complicated but still true? Yeah. So the model that we had about like not we had about we literally this is this is what I would have told you. This is what I was taught by my mentors, by my professors, or when you watch TV, a documentary. Um, you know, we left Africa. Let's just say a hundred thousand years ago. Give them an odd number. Non Africans left Africa a hundred thousand years ago, and within Africa, also there was an expansion. And so, twenty five years ago, the model was very simple. About a hundred thousand years ago, one to two hundred thousand years ago, one tribe eliminated everybody else. Right. So it was mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosomal Adam, and then the Neanderthals disappear. All the other cousins in Africa disappear. Other things in Asia we don't know about disappear, and it's just us, you know? It's a simple story. In a way, it also dovetails with um, certain, um, I think, cultural preconceptions or priors about the singular exceptionality of modern humans. And, um, you know, if you want to talk about, like, you know, a religious interpretation, it's not that hard to kind of reconcile in a way. It's like, okay, there's a singular creation in East Africa. 150,000 years ago, and then from that comes the rest. And that's what we knew, and that was the orthodoxy, and that's what you would read. I think um, there are multiple chinks in this armor, but I think the, the first one, and I have a, you know, in my Substack post, which you know, I know you're going to link to, so I'm going to describe it, not in detail, but just so people can know what they're going to look at. It's basically like shows a bunch of um, lines and then arrows between the lines. And so it just shows all the interactions. So what used to be kind of, a tree with a rapid expansion is now a network. Um, there's still a predominant African signal in there, but um, 2010, it was quite clear that everybody outside of Africa has a couple of percent Neanderthal ancestry. So that's an immediate refutation of this idea that we replaced everybody else because we didn't. Like both of us here have about 2% Neanderthal ancestry. People within Africa have less, but they also have it. Later, it was found at lower fractions because of mixing. But in any case, Setting that aside, um, that tells us immediately Neanderthals and humans, modern humans, sometimes they call them stem humans now, could interbreed, uh, could exchange genes, right? And so that is a chink in the armor and the idea that we were a special exceptional creation because some of our ancestry is not from that African root. It's from an earlier migration, Neanderthals and our Denisovan ancestors, which is the second population, at the end of 2010. Um, an ancient genome. So this is these genomes are coming out of um, a cave in Siberia called Denisova Cave. They found Neanderthals, they found modern humans, they found Denisovans. Denisovans are an East Asian population um, related to Neanderthals. They separated like, let's say, 500,000 years ago. And, um, you know, it turns out, like, depending on how you estimate it, 2.5 to 5% of the ancestry in Papua comes from Denisovans. In East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, it's like 0.2%. It's much lower, but it's there too. So we have at least, at minimum, two confirmed uh, admixtures, two confirmed instances of humans interacting with other human lineages and getting this like very different ancestry into our genome. Right. So that's that, that that's a change there. Just, just one quick question: When you say humans, which Homo are we talking about here? Yeah. So, so I so this is kind of like a uh, not philosophical but cultural difference. Paleoanthropologists tend to be splitters. And so they'll say, you know, because like it's Homo sapiens versus Homo neanderthalus, right? Uh, if you talk to most geneticists, my personal experience, and I agree with this, probably we should just say all Homo are humans. So mm -hmm. Neanderthals are humans, you know, African, modern, you know, Paleo Africans are humans, whatever. But that obviously gets semantically confusing in the language. Mm -hmm. And so we usually say modern humans, but people are trying to figure out a new word for it because what does that mean, modern humans? So for example, uh, you know, people think um, our foreheads and our chins, oh, like we look so much less primitive than Neanderthals. It turns out that our chins are, um, they're a primitive characteristic. The Neanderthal chin has evolved, right? So modern versus archaic, these are words we used to use, but they don't really describe anything real. They're just labels. Mm -hmm. Scientists have not figured out a new label. Like, for example, I don't, I'm not going to use this label, but I'll tell your listeners. The, the common label for this modern African expansion, the modern Africans, uh, about 95% or greater of our ancestry, you know, 95 to 99% uh, is like stem lineage, which, okay, that doesn't roll off the tongue. But, you know, I mean, you're the, you're the writer. Maybe you can think of something. Uh, this requires a different mentality, right? But the, the language is all confused because the terms were created before we knew the new reality. 
you know, and the new reality is, yes, it's mostly a tree, but the, the branches are connected by these gene flow events. And so, like, for example, um, and like, it's a really busy, busy network or chart that the, you know, if the listeners go and check it out, um, there's probably three to four Denise of an admixture events that contributed to the ancestry of East Eurasians. Okay. It's starting to get complicated. With Neanderthals, it looks like only one event contributed to us, but we have recorded instances of other events. It's just those populations died off. So, you know, the whole, like, you know, I think it was a 1980 song or 90s, like people are still having sex, right? It's like, yeah, that was happening, you know? Um, like 25 years ago, you used to talk to people. Uh, you talk, I would talk to scientists and they'd just be like, I mean, come on, like, have you seen our reconstructions of what Neanderthals look like? Like, do you really <laughs> think? And I was just like, I don't know if you're talking to the people that I'm talking to, because <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I can introduce you to some guys, you know? Okay, so, so I, but I, if I understand what you're saying, there's a lot more feedback loops and mongrelization, which I don't use in a, in a sort of uh, eugenic sense. Right, I, I just mean sort of like... You said hybridization. Hybridization. hybridization, right? Diver, diverse. I mean, like I, I like. I'm a, I'm an owner of a mongrel. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm with Teddy Roosevelt on mongrel vigor. But regardless, hybridization, right? Different populations breeding that make this story very difficult to tell. But we still think the ur, the original, the proto humans, like the Denisovans. That's not a parallel species growing up right they that their ancestors came homo, from somewhere homo is probably homo homo arose i did a podcast with chris chris Stringer, the paleoanthropologist like a couple of years ago basically because i asked him for all the paleo like the bone stuff because i don't know that off the top of my head homo what i would call human arose probably in africa about a million years ago so if you want if you want to ask me like when did humans emerge i would just say a million years ago were they humans like us no i mean this is before neanderthals right so the Neanderthals, they call them Neandersovans. That population that left Africa, like say seven hundred fifty thousand years ago, they're the ancestors of Neanderthals and these They themselves are African. Why does everyone come out of Africa? Like my short answer to that is, I think it's warm, it's big, like large population numbers for large mammals. Like we already see that today, right? So I think it's just like simple kind of physics almost. Right. Well, and also the primate creatures we derive from, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah didn't live in Siberia, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Yeti not, not was... Like, our cousins, our cousins, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, like, it's like, we're, we're an African genus. We're, that's, what I, that's what I'll say. Okay, that's, all right, that's helpful. Um, now I get it. Okay. The next one is, uh, there is no one big IQ gene, just a lot, lots and lots of minor ones. Now, I... We're both friends with Charles Murray. Uh, this one was less shocking to me, but I think it's important. It's also an important thing to point out to people is like when people say you inherited intelligence from your parents or whatever, intelligence is highly heritable, but what intelligence is genetically is really, really complicated, right? That's fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So why don't you talk, sort of talk through, Yeah. you know. Okay. So, um, so about 25 years ago, um, again, like I'm, I'm kind of like anchoring it to the year 2000, you know, um, just I feel like, because in the year 2000, that was the future, right? We can get Conan O'Brien here to hold candles in the year 2000. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. That was when I read Genome. Um, that was also, you know, I was reading New York Times, you know, Nick Wade's pieces. There'd be articles about, you know, like IQG, like Plobin, uh, Robert Plobin's lab um, in London. And they were doing like candidate uh, gene analyses, which basically means like small sample sizes, looking at specific genes. And, you know, they would say, like, oh, well, this gene causes, like, a 10-point increase or whatever. And it was like, that's cool. Like, whoa, like, you know, a single gene, blah, blah, blah. We didn't really have any uh, good understanding. We didn't have a human genome around then, okay? So we just didn't know. It was Terra incarnita. Um, but now we have, like, huge sample sizes. All of those original results are basically probably, you know, uh, just, like, you know, the p-values are also a random variable. P-value. Explain that to normal people. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so, oh, p-values are complicated. So uh, basically, <laughs> um, it's just like the probability uh, uh, of like randomly getting this result. Okay. Okay? And so like you do enough studies, you will randomly get certain results. And so if people only publish the studies that get the positive results, you know, like the novel results, 
then you're going to uh, mistakenly just publish random results, okay? There's, a, there's what people call p-hacking, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were doing conscious p-hacking, but this was before we were very well aware of it. Yeah. So this is p-hack stuff. And, um, you know, in the last 20 years, people have looked for big effect genes. There are some big effect genes. So like, if you have like a, a trisomy 21, you have Down syndrome, right? Uh, that's, so that's chromosomal, you know, whatever. That's a huge effect. There are things at the bottom end um, that affect, uh, you know, whatever, that, that decrease a lot. But in the normal range, uh, it doesn't look like there's any single gene that's an IQ gene. There's just, there's like hundreds to thousands, depending on how you want to cut, do your statistical cutoff. But uh, it's basically, you can just assume um, it's like a quantitative trait where, yeah, you're, you know, it's like traditional, uh, you know, statistical genetics, heritability. You look at your parents, they can predict some of it. Then you have like an expected value and then like variance around that. And it's basically like, you know, just like central limit theorem, like the bell curve, everything like that. It's not like, oh, DNA and we know like this gene and that's why, right? So if you have, uh, I don't know, if you have like, uh, if you have cystic fibrosis, well, we know why. There's CFTR, there's mutations in CFTR, and we can tell you where. You know, like if you have like a high IQ, it's a or low IQ, low IQ is easier because as I said, um, there are like big mutations. I mean, Down syndrome, if you want to count that as a mutation is an illustration, but there are others like deletions and other things that just cause massive problems overall, not just intelligence. And that'll drag you down. Okay. But I'm talking about the normal range. So if you have a very, very high IQ, uh, to my knowledge, you know, and I, I, like, I know the people who are researching in the frontier, so I think I would probably know pretty early. Um, any case, um, to my knowledge, there is no gene that is known, and there have been some candidates, but there's no gene that has been verified and confirmed that gives you a high IQ. The only reason you would have a high IQ is because your parents have higher IQs, probably, and you know you have a lot of genes for those. And so you can create what's called a polygenic index. Uh, this is done with traits like height, IQ, but also like your risk for type 2 diabetes, which is also caused by many genes, you know? And so it turns out a lot of traits, not just IQ, uh, I picked out IQ because it's a sexy trait. We've studied a lot, actually, but uh, a lot of diseases like your risk for type 2 diabetes or your risk for schizophrenia, they tend to have this tendency of being controlled by a lot of genes. Now, schizophrenia is very heritable. It's 80% heritable, right? So it's very, very genetic, but there's no schizophrenia gene. It turns out there's just a lot of genes that will cause your risk for schizophrenia. Autism is somewhat similar too. Very heritable, probably a lot of different genes, genetic architecture. Anyway, so uh, this is just a common tendency and I wanted to highlight that. I know this is a, it's not a question that you can explain, answer on an elevator ride, but um, why? <laughs> like, why wouldn't you have, let, let, let's just sort of stipulate that in Darwinian terms, there's an evolutionary advantage to being smart. Right. In the same way yeah, that there's an evolutionary not. advantage to being strong or tall or fast or these kinds of things, right? To one extent or another, right? Context matters. Okay. Do, uh, let me put it this way. Does the fact that it's a bunch of different genes mean it's any less selected than if it was a single gene? Again, uh, I got to say, uh, I do listen to your podcast. Uh, and I have to say, I'm not like trying to be, um, not trying to kiss your butt, but, uh, you have a way of like for not knowing anything of getting a question, so I just gotta, <laughs> so I'm like kind of like smirking <laughs> here. That's a, that's a good question. Um, anyways, uh, I'm taking I'm taking notes here. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, so actually there is an answer to this. Uh, so if you read a population genetics book, they will tell you, and this is like a stylized fact, which is not always true, but is often true. If you have a quantitative trait that's on a bell curve distribution that's controlled by a lot of genes, what that usually tells you is the trait is no longer subject to strong selection. If it's very heritable, so it means it's controlled by a lot of genes, but there's still a lot of variation in the trait, that means it's not subject to strong directional selection. So single gene traits, a lot of times, are subject to negative or positive selection uh, very strongly. They're swept to fixation. So for example, like lactase persistence, lactose tolerance, very, very high in Northern Europe. Uh, we have a lot of evidence now um, that it's due to strong positive selection within the last 3,000 years. Whereas the human wild type... Is positive like, selection meaning that if... You didn't have this gene, you might die. Yeah, yeah. Or like, what's well, so not example, reproduce. Uh, well, milk. Uh, so, for example, milk. Uh, a third of the caloric value is in the sugar, the lactose. So you're missing that if you don't digest milk as an adult. And also, you'll have like gastrointestinal problem potentially. But so, um, in terms of intelligence or height um, or strength, it actually is not 
clear that being at basically what the the curve is telling you is that being at the extreme is not necessarily that good. So let's talk about size because that's easier to like get at Uh, because you said strength. Um, There's actually a fair amount of evidence, uh, very strong evidence uh, from the people that work in this area that our our skeletal systems over the last 10,000 years have gotten much more frail. Like your bones are like thinner, um, just like less, we're just less bony. And some of this is, is like if you look at the skulls, but some of this is environmental. Like we eat like uh, much soft. We're like like we, me and you, Jonah. We are the descendant of gruel eaters. That's the way I would explain it. We're descended from like thousand, you know, a thousand generations of people eating gruel. Okay, whatever. So uh, our our forager ancestors, like during the Pleistocene, they have big jaws uh, and like robust skulls because you know they're chewing on a lot of tough stuff. You can see this in older European skulls. Like I'm not like a big skulls guy, but like. You look at like a Neanderthal or like a you know an older human skull, older modern human skull, and they are robust. And um, you know this was like a big issue uh, in race science in the early 20th century. That's actually still true of Australian Aborigines. But guess what? They never went through an agricultural phase. And so why is thinner? Why is like less bow being less bony, like you know re- less robust, selected for a little bit? Well, it turns out I mean, it's probably just metabolically intense. Like to put down bone and to be bigger. That costs something. So if you don't need to do that, don't do it. So when it comes to muscle, um, obviously there are downsides of being muscular. There are downsides of being taller. If you're taller, if you're larger, you need more calories. Mm-hmm. So if there's a famine, Tell me about it. yeah, yeah. If you need, it, you're, you're hungry. I mean, maybe you're on the, maybe you're on the menu. You know, I don't know. But my point is, like, you don't want to get too large. Also, uh, just in terms of physiological fitness, once a man gets above about like six two or six three, there's all sorts of health things that start kicking in. So uh, basically, there's there, there's a top uh, for for size where it's like it starts to cause problems. Actually, um, we know from the evolutionary psychology literature that you know being a tall man is uh, obviously somewhat more reproductively fit. But uh, the downside is if you get too tall, uh, you know. So for example, like there's like uh, circulatory issues and lung tears. These are two things that I can just I know for tall men. Okay. Um, also, like obviously they need more food. Okay. Uh, so that's an issue. Also. It's good to be a tall man. It's not necessarily as positive to be a tall woman. So there are issues with at certain heights, uh, the fertility might start dropping. And so, I mean, you know, I could just say it's complicated and stop it there, but um, it is not necessarily positive to be at the extreme tails of these quantitative traits. And uh, the reason that there is variation uh, is probably because it's going for some sort of happy median. And so there's always selection going for that happy median and the people at the tails are just like random outliers. That's the way I'm going to explain it. Uh, for the listeners out there with genetics backgrounds, I'm just talking about diversifying selection and balancing selection. That's what I'm talking about. But with intelligence, and again, we, I, I, we should just be clear. With intelligence, we, with, with intelligence, we know that the fitness in the modern world, the more intelligent you are, the fewer children you have. So, I mean, right there, you know, I mean, I mean, if John, if John von Neumann shows up in a forager community, he better keep his mouth shut. <laughs> but I think they're going to burn him as a witch or something. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but I mean, like, that's I mean, that's that's uh, anachronistic, though fun hypothesizing. I mean, like, if you have someone who's very smart, who grew up in that culture, their ability to na- like, they've never made. My, my friend Ron Bailey once told me they've never made a test that dumb people can score better at than smart people because smart people can pass the Turing test of whatever are have a more like higher likelihood of being able to figure out what the test giver wants from the test. And that's true in social situations too, in general. Um, and so like you would think, I, I know the sociology better, but like, you know, you would think that sort of the iron law of oligarchy would apply a little bit when it comes to intelligence It's the people who know how to navigate social situations, complex systems, even halfway complex systems would have first dibs at a lot of resources um, because they know how to play games. And I'm not saying that didn't happen. It just seems to me it would be more selective. Well, I mean, okay. There, there, you know, there's a whole, whole body of evolutionary psychological literature. Uh, that talks about how social and social uh, dynamics is what's driving um, our big brains. So our, you know, our the Homo lineage, our, our brains kept getting bigger up until about two hundred thousand years ago. Like Neanderthals, modern humans, everybody from like from like two million to two hundred, 
they kept getting bigger. Why? I think the most plausible hypothesis is the social hypothesis. Like we're just good at social stuff. Okay. But that is not totally. And social stuff brings rewards so that it's this catalytic effect. That's not totally reducible to IQ because, so for example, women on average are just better than men. Okay. And there's a lot of high IQ people as you probably know. So for example, Isaac Newton, obviously brilliant guy. Uh, he's quite clearly not the most socially adept. Right, right, right. right. You know? But yeah, I'm not talking about the extreme right tail people. I'm talking about how just generally, and maybe maybe your whole point is that it's explained that the average intelligence is getting yeah. better, and that's what you would expect. Because well, I, I think it's good enough. I, what I'm trying to get at is average is probably good enough. That's where reproductive maximum probably is. And you don't need to be, I mean, you know, John von Neumann didn't have a harem. In fact, he only had one child. And his child only had one child. Like, and I'm giving you an extreme example. The same is actually true at the low end. Uh, people with like very, very low IQ also have low fertility, right? So why do these people exist? Uh, what I'm trying to get at uh, is like, okay, there's mutations. Okay, that that will drag you down. Um, and then also just in like random mating, uh, there's going to be gene combinations of people at the high end as well, okay? And so what I'm talking about for the listener out there with genetics background, segregation variants and uh, mutational load. Like, you know, just so, you know, whatever. People out there know it. Right. And there's also, I mean, it just occurs to me, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, but like the assortive mating thing where, which Charles writes about, you know, in Coming Apart, it's a very modern thing to think that really smart men want to marry really smart women, right? It okay, used- maybe. That's what, that's what I would have thought. So do you, uh, you probably have stumbled upon Greg Clark's recent work Have you uh, about like social status? I'll give you a really quick, well, it's, not, it's not on the list, but I'll give you like a really quickly because like the listener will probably find it interesting. Basically, Greg Clark's an economic historian. He was at UC Davis. I think he's somewhere in Denmark yeah, now. I've heard of him, but I, I don't, yeah, I just haven't yeah, read Yeah, so him. basically what he shows is that uh, the assortative mating uh, by social status is way higher than we would have thought, partly because the single generation correlations are low, but, um, and so we extrapolate from that. So for example, like, you know, someone's like, dad is a doctor and they're an artist. But it turns out the grandchildren often regress back to the grandparents. And so the correlation is actually higher when you evaluate across many generations. The, uh, the short of it is uh, he shows that assortative mating was extremely high using uh, genealogical records in England going back many, many centuries. So here's a fact. Uh, 10% of um, British officers today uh, have Norman surnames. 1% of the British officers or British people have Norman surnames. So if you do the math, uh, it, the decay is like something like 75% heritability of social status. Because it was 100% in the year 1100, right? Like every every officer was Norman in the year 1100. But the fact that like, you know, 900 plus years later, they're still 10 times overrepresented shows you the heritability of these occupations. So you were saying, uh, so for example, in, in, in England 300 years ago, or 200 years ago, what Greg Clark shows is wealth is inherited through the father. Okay, that makes sense. Occupational status doesn't matter male or female. Hmm. Which is like, that's really confusing. Yeah. And the short of it is that it looks like a sort of mating has been happening uh, for our whole history. And in the IQ literature itself, actually, uh, there was a weird result in the late teens, like 2018, that was in the supplements of a paper because they couldn't explain it. It turns out that the correlation between spouses of the genetic score for their educational attainment. So the education, the years of education they had predicted by their genes was higher than their real years of education. So I explain that. So walk me explain that one again. What what's, what's going on here is you have this genetic score and that genetic score is correlated with the years of how many years of education you have, you know, whether you have a PH, whether you have like 11 years or eight years or whatever. Okay, and so you expect people with PhDs to be more likely to be with people with PhDs and bachelor's degrees, et cetera, et cetera, right? A sort of mating. Okay, um, but the weird thing is the genetic score, which can't explain most of it yet, because mm-hmm. there's, you know, that score is more highly correlated across the uh, spouses than the real years of education, which means that people are detecting something. They're picking up on something. And so... That's just kind of like a, this is a sideline. I mean, we should just go on, but I mean, it's, it's a huge area. No, no, that's yeah. very interesting. So like, like the, 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 you know, cause you, as you, as you know, journalists in particular tend to write about the stuff they can measure, which is different than sometimes than the actual thing. 
right? And so, like, the whole, you know, uh, you know, David Brooksian uh, wedding announcement stuff where it's, you know, Goldman Sachs marries Morgan Stanley kind of thing. If you actually look at the actual people getting married, it may turn out that so-and-so actually didn't f- actually get finish their MBA, but it doesn't matter, right? Because there's some other signaling going on. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah that's really interesting. You know, like the cheapskate effect is less. There's much to be discovered. That's what I'm saying. There's much to be discovered in this area. Okay. I will definitely put a pin in that. I think that is interesting. Okay. All right. My people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> European Jews are not just converts. They are a demographic synthesis. Yeah. Explain. This was like, this is like a, a duh. Cause like, but I just like, okay, just for the people out there, I did not, um, you know, 25 years ago, I was not giving a great deal of thought about Jews and the origin of Jews. It's a, it's a, it's a hotly discussed topic on the internet. I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah. Now it is. Now it is. Yeah. Yeah. Or I, I, I get I a call to Kazar that. like three times a day. So. Yeah. Which is false. <laughs> I know. So I know. actually, I, I, I tweeted this out. I was like, one thing I love about genetics is like, you could call it BS on so much stuff people make up because I'm like, no, that's wrong because we have the data. And then like, you know, and they have to go, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's a Debbie, Debbie Downer for them. But so basically uh, European Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, the Ashkenazi, they are basically what they look like. Like in hindsight, it's obvious. Uh, they are a mixture of Middle Eastern population with European populations. And we know it very, very precisely now. We're about, because of ancient DNA, medieval DNA from places like Erfurt and central Germany, uh, we actually know how they emerged. And so I'm just going to like describe it real quickly uh, so that people like know. Well, what, 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 since we're doing this as things you've realized you were wrong about or learned more yeah. about, why don't you talk about what, what the conventional view was the 2000 versus what it is now? I don't think people had a strong view because we didn't have very much data on it. But it was like, okay, yeah, maybe they are all just converts, you know? I mean, there are Jewish people that have red hair, blue eyes. I mean, it's not common in the Middle East. And I mean, you know, th- this... I mean, I was like a genetics, uh, I was actually, my undergrad background is in biochemistry, so I wasn't a genetics person yet. But um, what I would say is like, you know, I think back then in the late 20th century, people, actually, no, I know this is true. People were still wary of making genetic generalizations about populations, especially when you didn't have that much data. Mm -hmm. And so the easiest thing to say would be like, oh, well, you know, Judaism is a religion, and these are European people that converted to Judaism. And they weren't saying this from any invidious motive, like, oh, you're Khazars, because most people don't care about that sort of stuff. It was just like, oh, okay, well, you know, most people were always where they were, and migration and all these things didn't happen. Well, now we know 25 years later that a lot of migration happened. And, you know, you, you've read my Substack, you know, that's true, right? But we didn't have that prior back then. And so I think the prior of like immobility uh, applied to European Jews as well. And so, you know, if you had asked me, I'd be like, yeah, I don't really know, but I don't know. Maybe they're just like our local people that converted. I don't know. That's probably what I would have said. I mean, I know that's what I said. I think I said that to someone probably like 25 years ago. I vaguely remember this. But like the more ev- evidence we have, the more clear it is that you know European Jews come out of a population with partial roots in the Levant. So, you know, I don't know how people want to take that, uh, but you know, the Y chromosome, the paternal lineage, the weirdest thing about this is really strong evidence that uh, the Middle Eastern ancestry of European Jews or Indian Jews as well, like the Bene Israel, Middle Eastern ancestry is paternal, whereas the maternal lineage tends to be local, which is obviously the opposite of, you know, Halakha, you know. Right. It's a little inconvenient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, they could have converted, whatever. But basically, uh, most of the European ancestry is actually like Southwest European, like let's say like, you know, Central Italian, you know, French, Iberian, that sort of thing. Really, Central Italian is like the best model for that and then a minority of that european ancestry so let's say 40 percent middle eastern 60 percent european and then like so it's like 40 percent is maybe central italian and then 20 percent northern european probably slavic okay that's probably the best guess right now we're 90 percent of the way of solving everything because of ancient dna there's a paper that's going to come out on the sephardim the sephardi jews of spain later this year or early next year i can't like tell you the details but not super surprising uh, but basically, I will tell you, Ashkenazi Jews, in, in part, are descended from proto-Sephardic Jews that have some more northern ancestry. Not that shocking, you know? 
So it's like these Jewish communities have connections, and the paternal lineages in particular show these con- connections. So uh, just so listeners aren't completely lost, um, the Khazar thing, which we've brought up a few times, the Khazars were a Turkic people. Um, famously, the head of the Khazars, I'm giving you a very shortened version of it, wanted to figure out what the best religion was. This is sort of like the Hallmark Card Channel version of the story. Invites all the leaders from all the great religions. The Jews convince him the Jews are awesome. So he converts the entire Khazar people to Jews. And a lot of, there are a lot of pejorative words I could use for some people who get really obsessed with this. <laughs> um, uh, like the black Israelites in New York have a whole thing about it. And it's a, it, there are various forms of anti-Semitism that like really rely on this. And you can do your own Googling. Um, but there is this weird fascination in some quarters about how Jews aren't authentic Jews, they're imposters, they're this, they're that. This other group are the real Jews or, or they're, you know, whatever it is. And, um, um, and sometimes it's really kind of funny because I got a lot of anti-Semitic email. The people who are accusing me of being Khazar or something, they seem to think that that, that accomplishes a lot in an argument about, you know, Israel or finance or democracy. You know, like it's, it's all very weird. But, um, can do we know? It's a little outside of what you wrote about because your thing was very short on this part. But do we know where's the Venn diagram on the genetic similarities, not just between the Sephardic and the Ashkenazi, but say the Ethiopian Jews, right? And you know these other disparate kind of populations. I have some Substack post on that. So uh, they're obviously not as well explored, but uh, uh, there's evidence on this. So uh, I, we can go through each one. So Ethiopian Jews. Um, to the best of my knowledge, they, I think, okay, to the, genetically, they look like uh, Tigray people, okay? So, like, Northern Ethiopian uh, Highland people. Um, my personal belief, and so, like, I'm bracketing this separately because I'm not sure about this, I think they're probably Judaizers. E- Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity um, is, uh, they circumcise, they don't eat pork, and so uh, that, it's, it's, a, it's a variety of Coptic Christianity, right? Meosophite Christianity. Uh, so it's already closer to kind of Hebraic norms. Judaization has happened uh, in Christian groups all across the world periodically with individuals and subpopulations. And so that basically means a shift towards Jewish identity and Jewish norms. So I believe that the Beta Israel probably are Judaizers and that they are converts from the Tigray that kind of took the Old Testament more and more seriously to the point where they're like, actually, we're Jews. We're just Jews. Because they, they were not, um, they did not, they were not part of rabbinical Judaism. They didn't have the Talmud. They just had the Torah. So I think like, that's that's the explanation for the Ethiopian Jews, which like still Jews. If you, I mean, in my opinion, if you want to say you're a Jew, you're a Jew. I don't. Not my business, right? Yeah. If you if you want to take all that burden on, yeah. you know, <laughs> not, that's on you. The that's great thing you. about Jews is that they don't twist people's arms about this. If you, but if you want to join, you can. You know, the Jews suck. <laughs> um. So the Indian Jews, uh, just looking at the genetics, it's really clear that their paternal lineage looks like uh like looks kind of like Mizrahi Jews. Mizrahi. So it's like yeah, Jews from like Iraq and you know the eastern you know, Iran and stuff like that. Um so they are part I mean if you look at you know a friends of mine I well I have a friend who's part of Benny Israel. Anyway, basically Indian Jews they kind of look a little bit more Middle Eastern than the typical Indian, but they also look Indian, you know so and there's like villages in Israel where there are Indian Jews, right? So there's a genetic connection there. And um, it looks like the Beni Israel in, in Bombay, like that community in particular, uh, almost became Hindu. Like I have a friend who did research on this. And basically in the 18th century, uh, uh, they started dropping away from a lot of like Jewish practices. And uh, some Jews in, in South India and Kerala who are, who are still in touch with the Baghdad Jews. So they never lost their like rabbinical Judaism. We're like, whoa, hold up, hold up, hold up. You know, so it's like, you know, you guys, you guys need to stop doing this weird stuff and get back to Judaism. And so they were a community that kind of shows you what could have happened. Uh, there were Jews in Kaifeng, China. Okay. And like the Jesuits, when they first met them in 1600, they observed that they were clearly physically different. Um, and they're probably descended from what's called the Rodanite Jewish community, which is like a trading community across Eurasia a thousand years ago. They're probably descended from Persian Jews. Um, anyway, so these Kaifeng Jews were there in 1600. The Jesuits met them. Uh, by the by, the uh, 19th century, early 19th century, um, Europeans who met them um, noticed they looked pretty Chinese. And um, anyway, uh, 
a rabbi of the community was married to a Chinese woman who, uh, um, this is like a story. I, I read this. This was very funny. Um, and she was keeping pigs in the front yard and he was very, very embarrassed about it. Cause he knew that, uh, that a Christian from the West would know that that was not <laughs> what should be going on. So that community disappeared. Um, they got absorbed into the Chinese and the Muslims. Right. And so there are all of these like little Jewish communities where some of them came back and some of them just disappeared. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's how that's how humans are. The Middle Eastern communities, um, a lot of them, they seem to be pretty old. Um, like so, for example, the Iraqi Jewish community, um, it, they look a lot like Assyrian Christians genetically. So sometimes people are like, "Oh, the, could they have been like converted from this or that?" Because Assyrian Christians, and I'm like, all these ancient Middle Eastern groups are kind of similar. So you just, it's hard to tell. So like people often ask, like, do we know that they were from Palestine two thousand years ago? And I'm like, uh. Probably, but I mean, until we get more DNA, we're not going to like totally uh, answer that. We will probably answer that in the next 10 to 15 years, though. Honestly, I would say we will. So if we have Cro, not cro Neanderthal DNA, um, yeah. is that because it was frozen in tundra and that therefore was intact? Is there a way to get biblical DNA? There is. A lot of it, a lot of it is geopolitics. Um, also, like certain cultures cremated. The Jews did not, so... That shouldn't be an issue. But a lot of it is uh, obviously, uh, so for example, uh, people routinely ask me, why don't we have more ancient DNA from Iraq? And I'm just like, have you heard about ISIS? You know, um, there's just there's just some geopolitical reasons that the Middle East, certain areas are undersampled. And so that will be resolved. Uh, Israel famously has a really good archaeological, uh, has good archaeology tradition. Um, obviously, there are you know some political issues right now. But um, I think that that will get resolved. A couple of years ago, like three or four years ago, there was some Philistine DNA, and Netanyahu made a comment, and that just caused massive issues for the published for the authors. But um, you know, I mean, Philistines, yeah, they they had some clear like you know Aegean ancestry. Duh, like you read the Bible, they were you know the description. They're clearly like part of Aegean, right? So um, you know, a lot of the things that we kind of thought or suspected have turned out to be true. And, uh, you know, shouldn't surprise us, I guess, but just, we get a little bit more precision on some details, you know, that's what I would say. All right. This isn't part of your subject, but it, it does. I think we might've emailed about it when I first brought this up. One of the things I cannot stand is you don't see it as much, but for a while, I can't remember if it was ancestry.com, but it was one of those companies and they were advertising and you had the one that really just drove me crazy was this guy who says, you know. I grew up Irish. I was all into being Irish. I did my genetic test, found out I was German, and he goes from dressing like an Irish guy to dressing in sort of stereotypical Epcot-centered German sure. lederhosen kind of thing. This idea, which is, which is sort of what you've been poking at all around on this, that your genes speak to your true identity is such a weird anti-historical point because you're talking about freezing any set of genes from a specific period of time you know 800 years ago like sure you may have a lot of viking dna but those vikings had dna from all over the place for a thousand years before that right i mean what like is there any sense in which like one can talk about one's genetic identity with a real sense of permanence to it um, well, so, I mean, I think like, you know, and I think this is implicit in our conversation, uh, you know, neither of us believe in like racial memory or like some like, you know, like world spirit of the race or anything like that. Uh, this is what I'll say. Uh, the weirdest example, not the weirdest, but like a weird example is there were this, and this was like in the big in the news, British newspapers, mostly 20 years ago, uh, two siblings who are neo-Nazis, Polish neo-Nazis. Okay, whatever. But let's set that aside. Uh, and they were like, you know, doing anti-Semitic things. And then uh, apparently their parents pulled them aside. And it turned out that I think like their maternal grandparents were crypto Jews. Like after the Holocaust and stuff, they were just like, we're just not going to like tell people. So it turns out they're half Jewish on the maternal side. And they just stopped being Nazis. Okay. So I mean, I in a way, it's just kind of like, okay, well... Obviously, that made a difference, but that's partly because Nazism is conditional on this genetic, you know, descent. And the, I think the the guy, I think the the brother, converted to Judaism officially, even though I think legally he was already Jewish. But you know, the records in Poland from World War II are not the best. I uh, converted to Judaism and moved to Israel. So this is like an extreme case where 
the genetic or the biological, totally. But that's because they started from a position, you know, as Nazis, that it right. mattered. Right. They were ra- they were race essentialists on one team, and then found out they were born onto a different team. It's like, oh, we got to join that team, which I think is incredibly stupid. I mean, I just want to yes. be clear. You know? but there, so there are. So it is a big thing. I think, like especially Americans, I think it's a little weird. Um, so I mean, actually, like I, I, I think I, I put, posted this on Sunday. So my mother in law turned um, turned uh, eighty, and so I just kind of like had a little tribute for her. And she's half Norwegian. Her maternal grandparents were immigrants from Norway. So you know, my children are half me. So my my family's from Bangladesh, and my you know my wife is you know German Norwegian. That's the easiest simplified way to say it. Uh, but um, so they're one eighth, or uh, yeah, they're one eighth genetically Norwegian. But actually, like, if my kids were ethnic in any way, uh, the Norwegian part is the only one that they could really tell you anything about because they spent a lot of time with their Norwegian, half Norwegian grandma. And her dad was just like generic American mutt. So again, her like, you know, ethnic sense came from her mom, who's a child of immigrants. And she grew up in Southern California uh, around her, you know, 100% Norwegian American cousins. And my kids go to Scandinavian festival every couple of years and et cetera, et cetera. So they're, one eighth of their ancestry is this one thing, but that's the only non-American ethnic thing that has an impact on him. On them, and it's not like for any significant reason. It's just you know, maternal grandmother, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I think that illustrates a lot more how it works, where culture and genes uh, are inherited in very different ways. You know, it's called like the dual inheritance model. With genes, uh, you're fifty fifty. That's just how it is, right? But with culture. Uh, you know, obviously you can inherit only your mother's or only your father's. And this sort of thing has happened uh, over like all of human history. So, um, you know, an example that I use on my sub that I think is interesting is, you know, like Hindu Brahmins, uh, their mantras, uh, you know, are very ancient, like 3,000 years old. And uh, they preserve like certain archaic features of Indo-European languages that are not preserved anywhere else. Now, genetically, Hindu Brahmins are about like, let's say like, 20 to 30 percent uh step pastoralist right there are people in lithuania that are like 55 60 percent step pastoralist but the lithuanians don't preserve any of that stuff because their culture was erased like they became catholic etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you like basically for a lot of the indo-european stuff that i write on my Substack, um a lot of the, the the textual stuff you have to get from hinduism because that's the only tradition that preserved it in a sacred way Whereas, like all across Europe, it just disappeared. Like we have the we have the Norse stuff, but Snorri Sturluson had his own views. So the point here is the 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 uh, the best distillation of ancient ancient Indo European customs are found in the Indian subcontinent. Even though these people have, on average, way less Indo European ancestry than people in Northern Europe, but the Northern Europeans just didn't preserve any of that culture. So you got you got to look at the Vedas. You got to look at the Hindus, and this sort of stuff happens all the time. So genes have a correlation with culture, but they're obviously not determinative. And uh, so you know, that's just how that's just how the cookie crumbles. I guess that's what we've seen. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. Like I'm on a bit of a ancient Rome kick of late, and um, been reading Tom Holland, listening to the rest of the history podcast, um, a bunch of other stuff. Anyway, like the the current fad for for Nash's nationalism, which wants to turn it into this ancient concept, it's like you look at the original. You look at all of these "quote unquote" nations of biblical times or ancient Roman times, right? It's like nationalism would say, "Well, they're all Italians," but it turns out, like on the Italian peninsula, people didn't think of themselves as Italians qua Italians until like the 19th century. And even then it was kind of late and some of them still don't, by the way. So, that's right. Some of them still don't. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, 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 I gotta say, like, if I have to choose between a world riven by nationalism or world riven, riven by city statism, I'm going with the city states. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but this gets to the point is like, like a lot of genetic reductionists want to talk about ancient nationalities when there were no ancient nationalities in the way we think of these things, right? Yeah. So this is just like quick sidelight. I'm not going to like get off on this, but I am actually writing about this right now. And by the time the podcast goes live, I might be live, but there's been a lot of work on ancient Roman genetics uh, because that's obviously important and interesting to a lot of people. So, uh, you know, basically I, I think the, the poet Juvenal complained, I think in like 150 AD that 
Uh, there are all these foreigners in Rome, you know, and we have a lot of textual evidence for that. Uh, it's not that clear looking at the genetics, though, um, and I, I'm just going to like end that there. But now we have ancient DNA, and it's it's starting to get clear what happened. And what seems to have happened is these Roman cities were very cosmopolitan. You have people from Spain, people from Syria, all over, like Carthage. The text, you know, yeah, and like yeah, yeah. you know, forty percent of the inscription and burials in like Rome, various periods are in Greek. Okay, so it's like okay, like that's very clear. But when you look at the modern genetics, you don't see very much evidence of these people at all. What seems to have happened is ancient cities are uh, their their birth rate shredders, just like modern cities. And uh, when the cities stopped getting migration, when the when the Roman system in the Western Mediterranean collapsed, they just went extinct. So the people who created the culture that we call Western Roman during like the Antonine period during the High Empire, uh, they were as cosmopolitan as the textual sources would tell you, but they left no genetic impact. So. Their heirs, their heirs are actually peasants from Lazio and from the hinterlands because those people kept reproducing at normal rates because cities were so unhealthy. And so ancient Roman culture was created by people that left no genetic impact in the modern world. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, like, that's the thing that gets left out a lot of the history books is just how you have, like, the whole idea of, like, ancient cities being ghost cities. But that happened all the time because like some crazy bad disease breaks out and everyone either dies or leaves. And then they think it's cursed because they don't know what the disease is, you know, and like even even setting aside disease, you look at the fertility rate. Uh, so like, you know, it's just like if you don't have in migration. It, the city's going to disappear. That's what clearly happened. To, set aside the Gothic Wars. That obviously didn't help. But like if you look at like like what the mortality like, you know, most, I think, like, uh, Marcus Aurelius's wife, like, she's, she's known to have, like, 14 live births. Over half of them died. And she's the empress. So what do you think it's going to be like for the urban proletariat? You know? So anyway, this is, like, a sidelight. We can just go on. But, uh, you know, it's just... No, that's right. It's really interesting. All right. Just find the gene and fix the disease. Why don't we just talk about that one to sort of close out? Unless there's a different one you want to talk about. No, I think it's a good one. Um, you know, news you can use. Uh, so this is a... This is this has not obviously been totally disproven. It's still a thing. But so in the 20th century, a lot of genetics, human genetics, was basically figuring out the genetic cause of a disease. So the best case is probably uh, not the best case, but like one of the best cases is or just like famous case is cystic fibrosis, uh, which you know people if they're going to have children, they often get carrier tested now. It's it's due to mutations on a gene called CFTR. Um, it's a single gene, and you know if you're both carriers, you know there are various precautions or whatever, right? Uh, if you're not both carriers, or if only one person is a carrier, then don't worry. And so um, these single gene, uh, these single gene models uh, are very important for human genetics because a lot of the diseases that you you don't know about, uh, like Huntington's and stuff, are affected by these big single gene things. And um, that was our, the logic in some ways for the Human Genome Project and early 21st century genomics is like, oh, we'll like sequence a bunch of people and we'll get all these single gene diseases. CRISPR will fix everything, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, like, that's what, like, so for example, like, uh, all the, like, most of the diseases that affect you late in life, like, uh, you know, various types of, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, um, some of the, a lot of the mental diseases that, like, have a big impact and are heritable, like schizophrenia and autism, they are due to mutations on lots of different genes. And so, um, it's just like, we got to brute force this. Like, we, we just have to sequence a lot of people. Um, and then eventually we will figure it out. So, you know, so concretely, um, you know, there are already predictors of, uh, so for example, I'll, I'll give you autism is about 70 to 80% heritable. Uh, most people who are autistic are not like Rain Man. Uh, they are mentally disabled. You know, a lot of parents who have autistic children, uh, you know, they live in terror about what ha what's going to happen when they die because their kids can't navigate the world. This is not like, this is stressful, you know? Okay. So there are people, um, you know, they're like, oh, I have an uncle who's autistic. And so, like, you know, obviously you know that this person has a genetic risk. And so there's no guarantee. So again, as I was saying earlier, it's like a, it's like a, a, a toss of the die. And so um, how are you going to, how are you going to fix that? Well, you know, you could do in vitro, you know, embryo screening, these sorts of things. Like we have the technology. If it was a single gene, it would be trivial. You just look for the gene. But that's not what it turns out. It turns out it's like, you know, Dozens of genes for autism, dozens to hundreds probably. And so um, obviously that is just 
just more difficult. Um, and it's requiring, so, you know, we're talking about sample sizes of millions of people because some of the risks for autism are particular to your family, you know, or your particular subgroup. They're not particular to the whole population. So if you, if, if basically you could study, it was the analogy you were using about statistical representativeness, right? Um, it's like, if you have a representative sample, yes, you can make predictions off it. But the fact is, with this sort of variation that's really diverse and heterogeneous, to get a representative sample, you'd get a really big sample. I have friends who have autistic kids of various points on the spectrum. And one of the things you often hear is that this is overrepresented among high IQ parents. That um, Now, I'm totally willing to believe that, but at the same time, it just so happens that my sample are all high IQ people. And I have, I, I, I also know that parents starting with me have a very high tendency to blame themselves for anything going wrong with their kids. So like, do, what do we actually know about that? Is that true? How true is it? So I don't think it's the IQ. Um, if there is a genetic basis, I think it usually is probably attributed to older parents, older fathers in particular. Um, because the mut- sperm keeps mutating, so there's some evidence. I, I don't for the listeners out there, and like this is what I'm gonna. This is what I tell my friends. Really, you should probably not worry too much if you're a 45 year old man and you're gonna have children. It's like a very minor impact. So I honestly don't stress about that. But in the population wide aggregate, older fathers produce like more schizophrenic and autistic children. I think. I mean, that's there's some good evidence for that. Um, so there's some of that. I actually think most of the reason that you see this is uh, diagnosis, uh, just like the, the bias towards diagnosis. And so I think that's what really explains it, which you know I hope is reassuring to people or not. I mean, you know, have, you know it's just difficult having a child that's different. But, so I, you know, but I just want to say that. All right. So I said that was the last one, but I got one more. One of the things I, you, you touch on it in your, in your piece, one of the things a lot of people who don't know anything about genetics, including me, have talked about since we were kids is whether or not evolution is over, right? Like, are, like, are we going to, like we were, we almost lost that baby toe, but now we're not going to because it kind of stopped, right? How should people think about that? Yeah, so there's two, there's two, two, two ways to think about it right now. Uh, there's the theoretical uh, thing that I will like, get to real quick, but like the first thing that I want to say is again, like the statistical genomic techniques that we have, um, we actually basically you couldn't really. You couldn't really do anything with natural selection in humans because, like, obviously you can't experiment on humans. And we didn't have any Someday HDMA. we're going to change that law. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, in any case, in any case, uh, but so, but with, with genomics, like, you could actually detect natural selection. So I mentioned lactase persistence uh, earlier. So, you know, you could, like, see the signatures in the genome. Uh, a lot of the genomic methods, though, they have, uh, you know, weak power to detect recent selection. So if a selection sweep is still happening, uh, you can't detect it like closer than 500 years. What people get confused about there is those, just because you can't detect it because of the statistical details, doesn't mean it's still not happening. So there could be selection sweeps that are still happening, okay? Um, so for example, there is evidence that that our skeletal structure is still getting more frail, you know? Uh, there's still evidence that lactase persistence might still be selected for. Some a lot of these things, no one knows why. So we have a lot of circumstantial evidence that selection is still happening now because we can actually detect it. Okay, uh, the theoretical issue here is a lot of people. Uh, I, I thought this twenty five years ago because I was not an evolutionary biologist then. I didn't think that that way. Um, is okay if you have low infant mortality. How is selection happening? So the simplest explanation of how selection is happening is uh, miscarriage rates are like thirty to sixty percent in humans. So there's still selection happening there. Uh, uh, most of those miscarriages, women don't know about. They happen very early on. Uh, but there are cases where it's late enough and you know, if they go to the hospital, you see the fetus, all these issues. So there is a backstop. That's the way I'm going to say it. Uh, yeah, just in terms of like in utero, um, in terms of like too many mutations building up, right? The other thing is like for, for, for adaptation to happen, you need a couple of things. You need something to be heritable, okay? Uh, so it needs to be genetically transmitted within the population. And you need to be to have uh, 
differential fitness by the traits. So, uh, for example, uh, what if being a Haredi Jew was heritable? This is like made up. Uh, well, I mean, they also have like very high fertility, you know? Uh, so this is a cultural thing, uh, but, you know, same logic applies. There are still subpopulations that have higher fertility, um, and there are still tr- types of people. I think, I haven't looked this up, but I, I think like, uh, like if you have BPD, bipolar disorder, I think you do have higher fertility. And I think a lot of that has to do with impulsiveness, okay? Uh, so uh, we are actually selecting for people that are impulsive, uh, probably lower conscientiousness, all of the big five personality traits that um, you know make it so you don't do safe sex, like that sort of thing. Uh, so we are still evolving. We are still changing. Uh, there is also some evidence for uh, uh, selection. So for example, again, educational attainment genes, like this is controversial. People don't like to talk about it. And I'll get canceled for the 20th time for saying that for like, Things, but if you look at the papers, it's pretty clear that there is evidence. Uh, and like you know, privately, people have told me, Yes, it's totally true. Uh, there is evidence for uh, selection against EDU genes, uh, for like educational attainment. The more educational attainment you have, uh, the fewer children you have, and that's partly correlated with genes. So, you know, we're selecting for people that have genes for less educational attainment, and that's pretty clear in Western samples for the last century. Because we have we have data from places like Iceland, you know, we have a good genealogical, we have the genomes of the modern people, and we have their pedigrees going back, and it's pretty clear uh, that we are selecting for people with lower educational attainment. Again, that probably is partly due to personality, conscientiousness, all these other things. But yeah, we're changing uh, in various ways. Uh, we're getting frailer um, and all sorts of other things. You know, probably like you know more impulsive. You know, whatever. It's but I don't I mean, know. We, we should also be clear about the language here is complicated because when you say we're selecting for it doesn't mean that people are actually searching out in an affirmative way to select for lower educational achievement it's that there are cultural factors that lead to higher fertility among less education and lower fertility among higher education yeah i think i think like technically when you say there'd be like a structural equation diagram and you would see like the causal factors here, and there's an arrow here, 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 and there's various correlations. But they they percolate down to the fact that, like, if you have a gene that makes you extremely conscientious, you know, if you have a bunch of genes that make you extremely conscientious, you are probably not going to be a teen parent. Okay? So if you're, if you're going to be a teen parent, so teen parent, like, if you have a child really early in life, your fitness is actually way higher. You're, you're decreasing the generation time. So having children early and obviously having a lot of children, it's very, I mean, it's just by definition, it's fit. And like, you know, in our social circles, we don't know, you know, I have three kids. That's a lot of kids in my social circle, you know, but like, you know, there are, there are some, some cultures in America still that have lots of kids and, you know, like some of them are like probably pretty like less known, like trad casts. You would know some, I I know some, but they have like what, like, it's not that big of a deal to find family with like six, seven kids, you know? Um, And so this is not like, you know, we don't, think of it as genetic, but we can wonder what type of Catholic becomes a traditionalist Catholic. Uh, are there, is their personality exactly the same as the generic person? I actually don't think so. Uh, so there are things that are happening in terms of sorting and assortative mating, as you were alluding to, uh, that we haven't like thought about in detail because it's like, you know, like, you know, there's a lot more interesting things in the world probably, but, uh, yeah, we are still evolving and we don't, we don't know, uh, we don't know exactly where we're going, partly because you know it's just not something that you're. The NIH is not funding it; no one really cares. Uh, but the outcome is probably, uh, you know, okay, less controversially, like stuff like disease, like malaria adaptation, all of these other things. We have a lot of we have evidence that, uh, for example, sickle cell uh, adaptation in African Americans that it's lower frequency than it should be, and that's just because. There's, there's no, there's not that much malaria in the United States. There used to be in the past, but not that much. And it's just single cell adaptation is not fit for you in this context. And so a lot of African Americans that had that mutation before the modern era, when we have much better uh, therapies, uh, they would die. And so selection. My sister in law died basically from sickle cell. So, I mean, I know a little bit about it. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's not great, you know? If, no, I mean, it's a terrible unless, disease. Yeah. I mean, Dev is. We know that the frequency is lower. So we see this in colonial populations, that the frequencies are changing. Um, 
I mean, I don't, I don't, we, we have to end it, but like, uh, actually, like, I haven't read about it in detail, but there is some evidence that Afrikaners have some adaptations to diseases in Africa. So this whole idea, like, whether they're really African or not, I don't know, it's a, it's a little weird, but they've been there for 300 years. They have, like, 5% non-European ancestry, and it turns out that they are now different from their Dutch, German-Dutch ancestral population in disease adaptations in the last 300 years. So if it could happen in the last 300 years, it's almost certainly happening now. Um, it's just like when, when you're in the middle of something, it's hard to see. It's hard to take notice of. It's hard to just allocate the attention is what I would say. Yeah. And the forcing mechanisms of the selection may have nothing to do with the cultural priorities that you think are relevant. I mean, like uh, my friend Lyman Snow, you know, he, he's done a lot of stuff on fertility stuff and, and he finds significant correlations with like proximity to good beach vacations and lower fertility. Right. And so like you could see <laughs> some of this stuff has to just do with prosperity and time on your hand and opportunity costs and all sorts of things that people don't think about as being drivers of evolution, because we think of drivers of evolution as stuff involving spears and war and disease. And it's just not that stuff anymore. No, no, because like that, that's, that's gone for now. I mean, yeah, one thing that I would say is, you know, with the fertility stuff, as you guys know, because uh, Lyman's been on a couple of times, is like people want more kids than they have, right? So it's like it, consciously we have a certain aim, but the reality of our lives are like buffeted by other factors. People run out of time, and that's how selection is happening, you know, in terms of all of these other factors. All right, Razib Khan, thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's great to have you on. Um, hope to have you back. We didn't even talk about dogs. Um, the Substack is called Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Obviously, we'll put it in the show notes and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, thanks again for doing this. Okay, so uh, Razib has left the studio. And, uh, you know, we don't do a lot of uh, science-y science stuff on here um, because I'm not um, super scientifically literate. But it's, I think it's good to do this kind of stuff from time to time. I tried to have him explain terms from time to time. Um, I am sure I didn't do it as well as I should have, but I think it was interesting all the same. Um, a lot of stuff to sort of chew on. I find the, the stuff about ancient Rome, particularly fascinating, um, <sighs> punditry. Um, so, you know, I'm recording this. I think Nikki Haley, while I was talking, announced that she was dropping out of the race, um, and suspending her campaign, whatever. Um, and uh, it shouldn't surprise anybody. I am uh, fairly uh, disappointed, dyspeptic, disillusioned um, by this grand experiment in democracy um, that we are stuck with these with these choices. Um, in particular, the the decision by the collective Republican Party and the right to renominate Donald Trump, which I just think is disastrously misguided for all sorts of reasons. Even if you love the guy for a thousand other reasons just as a sense of patriotic fidelity, rewarding the guy who did January 6th and all that and tried to steal an election is just a really, really bad idea. Um, you can think he's being unfairly maligned in a thousand different ways, but just for the greater good kind of thing, uh, this is a terrible, terrible decision um, as a collective basis. And, um, and I think we're going to be living with the consequences of it for a very long time. So anyway... Um, I have a very busy uh, couple days ahead of me. Um, I'm leaving for a big AI confab down in Sea Island, Georgia. I have a big speech to give. Got a big speech to figure out to write. I will not be on the Dispatch podcast, so um, you'll miss my rank punditry there, but I'll probably still do a solo, so you'll have that. Thanks again for uh, listening, and I will see you next time. No, you won't. This is a podcast.